Great. So today is uh, we're going to go over a solo 401k webinar. And really, um, you know, a solo 401k is a very powerful tool. And so the point of today's session is really educational. We're not going to be giving any type of legal advice or tax advice. Um, and so we're going to really talk about it at a high level in terms of who's eligible to set up a solo 401k and really some of the start to learn about some of the powerful benefits of it in terms of what you can do with the solo 401k. So to go into the first introductory slide here, these are the questions that we're going to be going through. What is a solo 401k? Am I eligible to set up a solo 401k? Can I roll over my retirement funds to my solo 401k? Who holds my solo 401k funds? Can I invest my solo 401k in real estate? Can I borrow from my solo 401k? And finally, how much can I contribute to my solo 401k? So to get started here, we're going to talk about what is a solo 401k. A 401k is, a solo 401k is, is really just a, a traditional 401k. If you look at the IRS uh, guidance and language, they talk about how it's really just a traditional 401k, but it's, it's a special subset or kind of 401k, which is referred to as a one participant plan. That's the technical terminology in the, in the, in the rules. And really it's designed for self-employed individuals because so you, in order to have a 401k, you need to have a business. And so even though it might be a one person business, the rules allow that business to set up a solo 401k. And so it's called a one participant 401k. And again, it's not, it's not a new type of 401k plan. It's got all of the same features of a 401k, but actually less compliance requirements. And the reason for that is a lot of the compliance requirements that apply 401k plans are there to, to protect your common law employees. But the, the reason for those requirements really goes away if you've got really just a one person business or a husband and a wife business, because the business is not gonna, be, is not gonna discriminate against themselves, of course. So a lot of the compliance requirements go away, and so um, it's much more streamlined, it's much, it's much more cost effective than a full-fledged multi-employee 401k. And so as you're reading about and researching solo 401ks, you might come across um, different terminology. Um, and I've got it listed here on this slide. You've got, it's sometimes referred to as an individual 401k, single K, uni K, self-directed 401k. And all that's really, all those are really marketing terms and referring to what, it, again, is called a one participant 401k plan. Now, before we go on to the next slide, I do want to touch on some of the exceptions to that one participant rule. One exception is for spouses. So if you have a husband and wife that say are got a, real, a realtor business, right? Um, even though there's that quote one participant requirement, there's an exception for a spouses. There's also, there's also exception for other owners of the business. So if you have two partners, two owners of an LLC, and it's a consulting firm, um, they're gonna be eligible. Again, and in, as long as the business doesn't have any full-time W-2 employees. So that's the other feature in terms of eligibility. It's got, the business cannot have any full-time W-2 employees. And so, um, in terms of what it means to be full-time, that's really going to be defined as working a thousand hours or more. And this is going to bleed right into our next uh, slide, which is, you know, eligibility. So in order to be eligible, it, it needs to be a business with no full-time W-2 employees. In terms of the business itself, uh, it's got to be an, a quote active business. If you look at IRS publication 560, which is the landmark guidance in terms of, I'm sorry, we're getting some feedback. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone.
great. I believe everyone can still hear me. Um, but go, going ahead with the presentation, the, it needs to be a, quote, active business. So if you, if you look again at the IRS guidance, which is uh, the landmark guidance is found in IRS publication 560, they, they talk about what it means to be self-employed. And really it comes down to making money off of your personal effort. And so some common examples, of course, would be, like I mentioned, alluded to before, you've got a realtor, um, perhaps a consultant, um, a solo practitioner attorney is gonna be eligible. Um, any type of professional services, of course, are gonna be eligible. Um, even an Uber driver right because that person is getting paid on a 1099 basis so an independent contractor somebody that might be you know working for a big corporation but they're getting paid on a 1099 basis those are all uh, good examples of people who are eligible to set up a solo 401k because they're making money from their personal effort um, now a common question that comes up is do I have to have a business you know do I have to have an LLC do I have to have an S corporation and the answer is no. The, how you organize your business is not going to impact whether or not you're eligible. Now, later on, keep that in mind, we're going to talk about contributions. And that, that does impact how the contribution limits are determined. But in terms of eligibility, the biz, your self-employed business could be organized as a sole proprietorship. It could be organized as an LLC. It could be organized as an S corporation. What's really important is the nature of the business. You've got to be making money from your personal effort. Um, sticking on that topic just a little bit, a lot of people will ask whether or not they have they might be making money off of real estate, say real estate investments. You know, they might have a W two day job, so working for a, you know a large corporation. That individual is not going to be self employed based off of that activity, but they might have a side. LLC that has a rental property. It's just they're earning passive income. That's an example that would typically not qualify because the income from that real estate investment is passive. You know, it's oftentimes it's going to flow on the Schedule C on their taxes, which is going to be passive income. They're not going to be paying any type of self employment tax on that income. So they're not going to be able to take the position that. An LLC that where they're earning passive income is somehow a self-employed business for purposes of setting up a solo 401k. And if you go back to, the, to that key concept, that basic concept of making money from your personal effort, if you're simply invested in real estate, you're really making money off of money that you already had, right? And, and so it's passive income. You're not paying self-employment tax. That's not going to be eligible. Now, another common question that will come up is someone will ask, they'll, they'll present a scenario where they have a W-2 job, but they're also might have a side business. Not the real estate context, but instead they could be, for example, an IT professional that might have some type of website hosting business or perhaps a web design business that they work on uh, during nights and weekends. And that individual, even though they have a W-2 day job, that's not going to impact their eligibility because they're able to use their side business again, assuming they're making money off their personal effort and there's no W-2 employees to set up a solo 401k. Again, that's another one. We'll keep that in mind when we go on to discuss contributions because uh, that will, that can impact their ability to contribute. So just to finish up with some other uh, important concepts in terms of eligibility, um, we did talk about spouses and partners and how they may uh, participate. Those are exceptions to that one participant requirement. Um, another important factor is control groups. So when determining eligibility, it's important to look at all the businesses that are owned. You might have a serial entrepreneur that could have a consulting business and might also be invested in a, have another business that has W-2 employees. If that person owns both businesses 100%, 
then those two businesses are going to constitute what's called a control group. And for purposes of uh, determining uh, 401k eligibility and who needs to be offered the 401k plan, the control group rules will, will tell us that the employees of any of either of those businesses are going to be considered employees for purposes of the plan. So if that person, even though they have a, a one person shop, that's a consultant consultancy business, the fact that they have another business with W2 employees is going to preclude that individual and they would not be eligible to set up a solo 401k. Okay, so let's move on then off of the eligibility uh, topic and go on to our next question that we covered over the, at the beginning of the, of the presentation. What, you know, can I roll over my retirement funds in a solo 401k? And the answer is generally yes. Most type of retirement accounts are going to be eligible. You know, you could have tradition, often a scenario is going to be somebody who's self-employed. You know, they may not have a 401k because they never worked at a big company, right? So this could be their first 401k. They may have been saving money in a SEP IRA or a traditional IRA. They may have had a, a previous job and rolled over money into a rollover IRA. So all of those, all of those accounts are eligible accounts. As long as they can liquidate that investment, they're going to be able to transfer it over to the solo 401k. A simple IRA is also going to be an eligible type of account, uh, provided they satisfy the two year, uh, the two year requirements. So they're going to have to have that for two years before they're going to be able to transfer it over. A former employer retirement plan, so once they've left their job and if their money is still with their previous employer sponsored plan, such as a 401k or a pension, um, a thrift savings plan, all of these again are gonna be um, eligible types of uh, plans. And they're all gonna be moved over as what are called trustee to trustee transfers or direct rollovers, depending on whether it's coming from an IRA or a, an employer plan. And Whenever you transfer money via a trustee to trustee transfer or a direct rollover, that is going to be a reportable event. So the previous custodian or administrator of that account is going to report that transfer. It's not a taxable transfer because it's, not, it's going directly to another qualified plan. As long as it's going to a qualified plan, such as a qualified solo 401k plan, then that's not going to be a taxable event, but it will be reportable the prior administrator or custodian would issue a 1099-R um, in the following, the following January to report that to the IRS. Um, and they would be issuing that with a code G in box seven. So that indicates to the IRS that this is not a taxable transfer. So that's gonna be important that, so in the whole transfer process, that's where you really wanna work with a, um, you know, people who have experience and expertise in guiding that transfer process. Because otherwise, uh, you could set yourself up for some pain and suffering because if it gets reported as a taxable transfer, then you would likely get a letter from the IRS when they don't see that income reported on the individual's taxes, they're gonna be looking for it. So we, we've, we commonly see those if, uh, you know, if the administrator I mean, it's uncommon with our clients because we lead the transfer process, but on occasion, you will see a, uh, an administrator that it makes a mistake. And so, you know, it, typically they can be resolved, but it's not something that you obviously want to set yourself up for. So sticking on the, the transfer and rollover topic, um, another type of transfer would be an indirect rollover. And that's come up, actually there's been some uh, activity in this area in terms of indirect rollovers. And in, an example of an indirect rollover would be um, where someone takes money out of their IRA, for example, and then they have, quote, 60 days. They have 60 days to put it back into another IRA or a qualified plan so to avoid paying the taxes and penalties that would apply if, um, if it was a distribution. So. Uh, those have recently been restricted such that now one is only able to do one indirect rollover regardless of the number of say IRA accounts that the individual has in a 12-month period. 
So that's definitely not an ideal way to transfer the money because number one, if you've done an indirect rollover in the past 12 months, then it's going to be considered to be a taxable distribution. If you take the money out when it, where it comes directly to you as opposed to going to the new plan. Um, number two, now you've used up your indirect rollover and if there is ever a need where you to, to take an indirect rollover in the, in the next 12 months, you're not going to be able to do that. So again, uh, finishing up on this slide, um, a couple key, a couple important more concepts would be uh, current employer plan and Roth IRA accounts. These are examples of accounts where um, oftentimes the money is not able to be transferred. Definitely not with a Roth IRA because the IRA rules do not allow one to transfer money from a Roth IRA to a 401k plan. The other example would be a current employer plan. So the rules, although the rules would allow one to transfer money from a current employer plan, what's often referred to as an in-service distribution, um, typically the rules that apply under that plan are not going to allow it. So your current employer is going to say, um, you're not going to be able to transfer money out of your 401k to another 401k until you leave your job. And sometimes they'll have a waiting period of say a month or even longer, particularly if you're in, working at a, a smaller company and you might be invested in say this um, stock of a closely held corporation where they can't just liquidate your, um, your, in, your 401k assets quickly. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic, which is who holds my 401k, my solo 401k funds. So the standard is really that the funds be held at a financial institution. So that could be a bank, you know, such as a local bank or a credit union. It could also be a brokerage. In terms of that account setup, what's going to be uh, most important from a 401k pers perspective is that the account is established in the name of the plan and that it uses the EIN uh, for the 401k. So just to use our uh, establishment process as an example, you know, our clients will fill out our application and then by the next day we will email them all the establishment documents that are needed to establish the 401k plan. And that same day, uh, we would go ahead and get an EIN from the IRS for the plan. And that's the IRS, based on guidance that we've gotten from the IRS specifically, that's their expectation uh, for uh, solo 401k plans. So this is, um, is going to be an EIN that's actually separate and distinct from the EIN that they might have for their self-employed business, such as their LLC or their S corporation. So this is an EIN in the name of the plan. And as part of the registering that, plan with the IRS, you know, of course, we're going to indicate that it's a 401k plan and the IRS will issue an SS4 form or uh, essentially looks like a letter from the IRS that, that uh, has the, the EIN number and that EIN letter is going to, is going to have some good language that confirms that the plan is a, is a tax, uh, you know, a tax deferred entity, which is, which is great. And so in establishing the account, you know, the individual is able to go to their local bank. Uh, we have contact people, for example, at financial institu institutions such as Wells Fargo. Um, they can also have the account set up at a, at a brokerage, uh, for example, Fidelity or Schwab or TD Ameritrade. And wherever they go, what's, again, what's important is that the account is in the name of the plan, the name of the solo 401k plan, and that it uses that EIN for the plan. And, and if you think about it, that's, that's important because let's say that there's, you know, some type of interest or some type of return that's earned on that account and the financial institution is issuing a 1099. Well, they're going to issue that 1099 in the name of the, uh, using the EIN for the plan. So um, the IRS is going to know that, hey, this is a 401k plan, so they're not going to go look for the, uh, that income to be reported on anybody's taxes, right? So... Um, in terms of um, bank versus brokerage account, um, what's important to understand is that the individual, number one, can have 
you can actually have both types of accounts. So oftentimes we'll see individuals that, for example, are looking to invest in real estate. And we'll get into more of this in a moment, but they'll want, for purposes of their real estate investment, they'll want to have a bank account. They'll want to be able to get certified checks. They'll want, because they might be going to auctions, for example, they might uh, want to have a debit card. So the bank will issue a debit card with, their, with respect to that account. So that's going to make it easier to pay for expenses related to their real estate investment. Um, the advantage of the brokerage account is, of course, that you're able to still invest in traditional investments, right? If you want to invest in the stock market or a mutual fund, of course, you can't do that through a bank account. You need a brokerage account. And so the brokerage firm or the bank, they're going to act as the custodian of the account. They're not going to police it. You know, that's going to be our responsibility. We're the 401k provider. We have the IRS approved plan. We handle all the ongoing compliance requirements with respect to the 401k plan. So, we'll, you know, if you take a distribution from your plan, the 1099R would need to be reported to the IRS, and we would handle that. Uh, Fidelity or Wells Fargo or your bank is not going to do that. Again, they're not policing the account. They're just a custodian. And so... Sticking with the brokerage accounts, though, uh, what's interesting is some of these, a number of these brokerage firms that we work with will actually issue a checkbook on the account. So the individual still has that checkbook access like they do with the bank account, but they'll also get um, the investment options that come with a brokerage account. You know, they can invest in mutual funds, stocks, CDs. So it's kind of a hybrid between the bank and the brokerage account. Again, not all brokerage firms do that, but a number of them do, such as Fidelity, and Schwab, and TD Ameritrade. So sticking on this topic in terms of you know, where the account is at and who holds my funds, the, um, thinking back to our eligibility discussion, where you had, say, the realtor, right, the husband and wife, they've got their realtor business, no W-2 employees, so they're eligible to set up a solo 401k plan. When, what's important is that the husband and wife's money is actually kept in separate accounts. So there, there could be, they could name their plan, say, um, Realtor Solo 401k Trust. And so husband will have an account in the name of Realtor Solo 401k Trust for his benefit. And then the spouse would have another, say, bank account in the name of the 401k for her benefit. So when the funds are rolled into the plan, her money is going to go into her account and then his money would go into his account. And so this same concept of keeping separate accounts also applies even if you have one person, if you have pre-tax money and Roth money. So with the solo 401k, you can have a Roth account. So you can have uh, Roth funds provided your provider's plan allows for it. I mean, for example, our plan does. And so when you have that Roth money, it actually needs to be kept in a separate account. So even if it's just one individual, say they have an IT, the IT person that has a W-2 day job, it has the side business, right? You know, that person might have their IT solo 401k trust account. If they've got Roth money and pre-tax money, they're going to have two accounts. One is going to be for the, the Roth money and one's going to be for the pre-tax money. And and just to shed a little, little more light on this, I mean, as part of our services, we do handle all of the documents that are needed, for example, to open the accounts at the different brokerage firms that we work with. So we would prepare all that paperwork and then the individual, the clients just needs to sign the paperwork and it, it's submitted to the brokerage firm and then uh, the accounts typically open in just a couple, matter of a couple of days. So typically this, these accounts can be set up in just a, you know, less than a week and then it's just a matter of um, transferring the funds over from wherever they are today, whether it's, you know, back to our list of eligible uh, accounts to transfer funds from. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's talk about investing in real estate. So if you, if you ask me what are the top three reasons that people um, want to set up a solo 401k plan with us, it's going to be real estate, investing in alternative investments such as real estate. It's going to be the ability to make contributions, and it's going to be the loan feature. So what, that's what we're going to focus on now. We're going to talk about all those topics right now. 
So let's start out with investing in real estate. And these concepts, keep in mind, do apply to other, the other types of alternative investments that you can invest in. Because really, in terms of investing in, when people ask what type of investments can I invest in, it's really a two-step analysis. Number one is, can, is it allowed under the rules, right? The statutory rules that apply to 401k plans. And then, is it allowed under the plan itself? So it's gotta be allowed under both. So even though the rules do allow for investing in real estate, typically a 401k plan, most, most 401k plans that people have experience with are not gonna allow for that type of investment. Because you could, might have a big, you know, your corporate plan where you're just able to invest in, uh, say, an aggressive mutual fund or a conservative mutual fund. Um, or even if you have a solo 401k through another company such as Fidelity or Schwab, they offer solo 401ks, but their plans are going to limit you to investing in something where they make money. Because that's how, that's how they make their money is they, they'll allow you to set up a 401k, but they want to capture that deposit because the investment options under their plan is just going to be, could be a, you know, a mutual fund that they offer, or it could be equities where you're going to be incurring trading fees. And so um, with our plan, you know, our plan essentially tracks what's allowed under the law. And so if you can invest in it under the law, you can invest in it under our plan. So clearly real estate is allowed under our plan. And so since that's one of the top reasons that people um, want to set up a solo 401k, I definitely wanted to spend some time talking about some key concepts when it comes to investing in real estate. So the answer is yes, you can. The, in terms of those key concepts, uh, one very important concept is that in terms of the titling of the investment, it's going to be very important that it's done in the name of the 401k plan, so the name that you would choose as part of the establishment process. So that real estate title is going to be, it's got to be in the name of the solo 401k. The income and expenses related to that investment. Let's say it's a rental property, right? So as those rental stream, as that rental stream comes in, or as you incur expenses, all of that money is gonna come in and out of the, that 401k account, right? So your renters are writing checks to your 401k, you're depositing it in your 401k bank account, and then when it comes time to fix the toilet or pay for some other type of expense related to that investment, you're gonna be paying for it out of that account. So thinking back to you know, our discussion of where the money's at, you may recall I mentioned that a lot of people like to have a bank account, right? So that a lot of that goes back to just a simple administrative ease of having a debit card, right? Because that's going to just make it easier to pay for those expenses. Um, going on to the next bullet here, no personal use. So, you know, let's say it's an Airbnb um, place, right? It's a, it's a rental property that you're marketing, you own through your 401k and you're marketing on Airbnb and, you know, you're not able to rent it out one weekend you know, you're not going to be able to use that or have your family members who are in town visiting you use that property, right? No personal use. Um, it's a vacation home, right? You're not going to be able to go and, you know, use it for one week, even if it's just one week, even if you pay your 401k, you know, you cannot do any of that. All that is going to be clearly prohibited under the rules. Um, another type of restriction is no, quote, sweat equity. So what I mean by that is, you know, let's say you're, a type of person that likes to, you know, fix up a house, even though you have that skill set, even though you're saving your quote, saving your 401k money, you're not able to work on the property. So if the toilet breaks, you're going to have to call someone, a contractor to come and fix it. So let's, um, moving on, let's talk about another common scenario. Let's talk about spouses. So again, let's think about that realtor couple, right? That, is self-employed, no employees. They set up a solo 401k. The husband has his account. The wife has her account. They're both in the name of the 401k for his and her benefit. They roll over money, say from an IRA, you know, and they're in the real estate industry. So they know the market. They invest in a rental property, right? Um, when it comes time to invest in that property, if they both want to use their funds, they certainly can. Um, What's going to be important, though, is that the income and expenses related to that investment need to be allocated 
based on the amount of money that they invested. So if the wife invested 60% and the husband invested 40%, she's going to be entitled to 60% of that income, and, but she's going to be responsible for 60% of the expenses. So when it comes time to buy the property, you know, they're going to write two checks, right? So the money comes from each of their respective accounts. Going forward, though, for administrative ease, they could have the money coming in and out of one account. They would want to reconcile, though. They would want to reconcile at least on a yearly basis and certainly before they took any type of distribution from the plan. So let's uh, stick on real estate because there are some, uh, some other good topics that we can go over that often come up. Another would be uh, tenants in common. So this is going to be uh, similar to the spouse scenario, but there's some key differences. So tenants in common refers to the fact that you have two owners, essentially. So you might have a, scen a scenario where someone says, well, I have, uh, you know, say I've got, I've kind of spent some money, you know, I maybe an inheritance, whatever it might be. They've got, if it's not qualified funds, right, it's say $50,000 in there that they want to invest in real estate. And let's say they have $50,000 in their 401k, right? So that individual uh, might want to go out and buy a property. I guess the obviously pretty cheap property for $100,000, but let's just to go with it. So in that situation, the individual and the 401k are going to be the owner, are going to be the owners of the property, and they're going to own it on a, as tenants in common. So similar to the spouse concept where you uh, – you know, the funds come from both, both accounts and the income and expenses are split according to, in accordance with the ownership percentages. So in that situation, it's 50-50, right? The uh, a difference, though, with the spouse situation is that you wouldn't have, you know, let's say it's a rental property. You know, you wouldn't have your renters writing checks just to the 401k. They'd actually need to send money to both, both the person, the individual person, and the, the 401k. So you couldn't have the money coming into one account, like we talked about, where you have uh, two spouses that have a solo 401k. So that's going to be an important difference. But that is a way where uh, one is able to couple money that's in, the 401, in their 401k account along with funds that are in their personal account. So that can be a pretty powerful tool. Sticking on, sticking on real estate, the final concept is uh, non-recourse financing. So what we mean by the, this is that uh, you're actually able to use funds that are in your 401k to buy real estate along with debt. But it's got to be a special kind of debt. It's got to be what's referred to as non-recourse financing. So most banks, you know, they're only going to do conventional financing. So th that means that for example, take your house, right? You own your house and uh, if you don't pay your mortgage, you know, the bank is going to foreclose on the property. They're going to sell it for quickly. It's going to sell it cheaply. They're going to take that money and apply it to the balance of your, of your loan, right? And then they're going to turn around and sue you for the, for the outstanding balance, whatever's left that you owe the bank because the bank has recourse against you personally. That's conventional financing in a nutshell. Non-recourse financing is different because the bank is not going to have recourse against uh, the, the owner. So in this case, if it's the 401k, right, the bank is not going to be able to go after your 401k. And so that means that they're going to view this differently from an underwriting perspective. You're going to see uh, higher down payment requirements. You know, it could be 30, 40 percent. You're really looking at specialty finance companies out there that do this. Um, Another difference is the terms could be shorter, the interest rates are going to be higher, um, but there are ways to, to combine your 401k funds with debt. And again, that can be a powerful tool. Okay, so let's go on. So another, again, back to the list of common reasons, and the top three reasons, another is going to be uh, taking a solo 401k loan. So again, think about the, um, you know, think about the, the realtor couple again you know they may have been self-employed you know their their entire life they may not have a 401k they may have accumulated funds in an ira right 
and you're not able to borrow from an IRA. The IRA rules don't allow you to take a loan. So the, they may want to uh, even use that mo money to grow their business. You know, they might want to do some type of marketing campaign. So if they're eligible to set up a solo 401k, they've got eligible type of retirement money, they can transfer it over, say from their traditional IRA into their 401k, and they're able to borrow from that 401k. And there is no type of, there isn't any type of a, uh, approval process. You know, it can be in a matter of a day. You know, if the money's in their account, then, uh, you know, they can just take that loan. They're able to take up to 50% of the balance, not to exceed $50,000. So if they transfer over 100,000, they can take out 50. If they transfer over 50, they can take 25. If they transfer over 200, they can take out, uh, they can take out 50. Because again, it cannot exceed 50,000. In terms of the, of the, of the terms, the, the loan is gonna be payable either monthly or quarterly. It's up to the client. It's gonna be payable with uh, payments of principal and interest. And the interest rate has gotta be a reasonable rate. Based on guidance from the Department of Labor, it would be prime plus 1%. So that's definitely where you, the vast majority are at. There is some flexibility. For example, you can look to CD rates um, as another uh, resource to, to build the rate. Um, but it's typically gonna be that prime plus 1%. So currently that's gonna be 4.5%. Um, of course, you are not paying it to us. You're not paying it to Fidelity or whoever's holding the account. You're paying it to yourself, right? You're paying it back to your 401k. Those payments are going to be uh, spread out over a five-year term. Unless you're using the money to purchase your personal residence, in which case you can have a longer term, but it's typically going to be five years. You're, there's really no restriction on what you can use those proceeds for. You know, you could pay down a credit card debt. You could use it for business financing to you know, grow your self-employed business. You could use it for your kids' tuition. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, uses. You're really not limited in what you can use it for. Um, it's gonna be important that the loan is documented. That's because it's gonna look like a distribution, right? You're taking money out of your 401k, so it actually falls within an exception for a participant loan. In order to meet that exception, though, you've gotta have these different terms that we just went over, and the loan itself needs to be documented. So as part of our services, we handled that loan documentation requirement. And we do that for no additional charge. We do it within one business day once the client notifies us they want to take a loan. So it's very uh, fast and easy. Um, you can pay off the loan with no prepayment penalty. Um, in terms of some of the uh, little bit of the complexities in terms of loans, uh, one is going to be multiple loans here at the bottom of the slide. Another is spouses. So in terms of spouses, uh, a common question that comes up is, well, the $50,000 limit, does that apply across the whole plan or is it just to my account? And the answer is it's at the participant level. So if you have the realtor couple again, you know, they're both able to take a $50,000 loan if they each have at least 100,000 in their account. Now in terms of multiple loans, the key concept here is, you know, a common question that comes up is someone might say, well, I want to take a $50,000 loan. I'm going to use it to, for this investment. I'm going to think I'm going to get paid back in six months. So uh, I want to then just pay off the loan and then I'll probably take another one a month later. And so the answer is you cannot do that because there's a 12 month look back period in, ter in determining the balance or the, the maximum amount you can take over of the loan. So if you have, a, if you've got a $50,000 loan, the outstanding balance on your loan in the previous 12 months, even if you pay back that loan, you're not going to be able to then just take another 50000 out. So the actual calculation is a little bit complex, but essentially that's the key, key takeaway for purposes of today's uh, discussion. Obviously, with our clients, we work through that calculation and uh, determine exactly what they're able to take out. Okay, so uh, let's go on to that last uh, slide here for today's uh, session. Um, how much can I contribute to a solo 401k? Again, one of the top reasons that people will contact us about setting up a solo 401k. Um, the answer is a lot more than you could contribute to say an IRA um, or even if you have a W-2 employer sponsored plan. Because what's interesting with the solo 401k is that you, there's actually uh, two types of contributions that you can make. 
you know, in the words of the IRS, if you look at their guidance, they actually talk about how you wear two hats, right? You're both the employer and the employee. So you can make both employee as well as employer contributions, right? Now, in terms of um, determining the limits, there's uh, several factors. You know, like I talked about before, one f at the beginning in terms of eligibility, you've got how the business is organ organized and taxed. That's a factor. Age is a factor. Um, the income, the self-employment income that the individual makes is going to be a factor, as well as whether or not and the individual is participating in another 401k plan. So we have, a, we have a calculator on our website. We have a lot of great information. We work with our clients, of course, to figure out what they're able to contribute. But just to kind of take some simple examples to illustrate these contribution limits. You know, let's say you've got an S corporation. That's your business organizes an S corporation. So one factor, again, is how much you make. So you cannot contribute more than your self-employment income. If it's an S corporation, that's, uh, that's a function of the W-2 wages. So let's say you have an S corporation where you have $50,000 of W-2 income. You're self-employed, it's just you, right? Um, no W-2 employees. Um, let's say your uh, one situation is you're under 50, right? So in that situation, you're gonna be able to contribute up to $18,000 of your W-2 income as an employee contribution. If you're 50 or older, you can make what's called a catch-up contribution. So that would be an additional $6,000. So that takes you up to 24. So that's the employee limit. It's gonna be 18 or 24. The, the next uh, contribution type is employer. So it's with sticking with that same individual that has $50,000 of W-2 income from his S corporation. He's able to make a 25% contribution as a profit sharing contribution or employer contribution. So at 50,000, that's gonna be 12,500. So if the individual is under 50, he's able to make up to 30,500 or an additional six if he's 50 or older. Now the overall limit is gonna be 53,000. So even if the individual is making say $200,000, they're not gonna be able to put in more than 53,000 or 59 if they're 50 or older. And that's the 2016 limits. They, they could go up, oftentimes they do, uh, you know, for cost of living, and, um, and we'll know more at the end of the year whether the, the limits will be raised for 2016. But that's the 2016 limit. So now let's, layer, let's add some, some complexities, right? Let's say that the individual is that, let's go back to that individual that's the IT professional, right? That has the W-2 job, and that has their side business, that's the web design company, right? Let's, let's say that that individual is maxing out at their W-2 job, you know, they're trying to get all the match they can get um, from their W-2 employer, so they're putting 18,000 into their W-2 employer sponsored plan. So the employee limit is at the employee level. So the limit is gonna look at all the plans that they're participating in, and since they're maxed out under their employer-sponsored plan, they're not going to be able to put any more into their 401k, their solo 401k. So if that person is an escort making 50000 of W-2 wages, they would still be able to make the employer contribution, the profit-sharing contribution, uh, the, because the employer limit is at the employer level. So it's not going to matter whether they have another plan that they're participating in making contributions to. So... That's a key concept. Um, in terms of other types of, just to stick on how it varies, um, you know, again, one, you can, so we've started to learn a little bit about how it varies. You know, one is age, so you're able to make the catch up if you're 50 or older. Another uh, variance is gonna be whether you're participating in another plan, so you can see that if you're participating in another plan, it's gonna, uh, that's gonna count towards the employee limit, but not the employer. Another uh, factor, again, is how the business is organized. So if it's an S corporation, it looks at W-2 wages. That's going to be the determining number. If it's a, uh, say, you know, a sole proprietorship where you're reporting that income or a single member LLC where you're reporting that income on Schedule C, then the determining number is going to, it's going to be a little bit of a calculation. You take line 31 off of Schedule C and you reduce that by one half of the self-employment tax 
and that would be the driving number. If you went through that calculation and that was 50,000, say for a sole proprietorship, you would still be $18,000 of that or 24 in terms of the employer limit. Um, in terms of the um, profit sharing limit though, it's not gonna be 25%, it's gonna be 20%. So it's gonna be a little bit different. And again, we've got a calculator and of course we work with our clients to determine those limits. Um, so they're, they're, it can be a little complex, but that would be another factor. In terms of different types of contributions, you know, continuing on in the slide here, you've got uh, Roth contributions and after-tax contributions. So this is definitely some uh, some higher level concepts here. Um, so just to touch on it a little bit, uh, Roth contributions, those are going to be part of your employee contribution. That's an employee contribution, just like a Roth IRA, it's after-tax, you know, so you've already paid tax on the money, you're putting it in. If you satisfy the qualified uh, distribution requirements, you know, such as keeping the, the account for at least five years, waiting until you're 59 and a half, then you're going to be able to take that money out tax-free, including, you know, including the gains. So that's going to count again towards your employee limit. So just to illustrate that a little bit, you know, sticking with that sole proprietor that is the S Corp that puts in $18,000 as employee, as an employee contribution that person would put that into a separate account because remember we talked about how with a Roth account it needs to be a separate bank account or brokerage account and they could put that 18,000 into that Roth account. Um, after tax, that's another uh, higher level concept, not as widely known. Um, if your plan allows for it, you can actually make after tax contributions um, even above and beyond the Roth limits, you know, provided your plan allows for it. Um, that the after-tax limit is going to be subject to the overall limit, which again is the 53 or the 59. Uh, so it's not going to be subject to that 18,000 like you have with the Roth. It actually goes into a separate, even another separate account. So a lot, of, a number of our clients actually have, th they could have three separate accounts. They could have a pre-tax account, a Roth account, and then the uh, the the after-tax account. So, um, so that's another concept, and we can talk about that offline with you individually if that's something that you that you want to look at. Self-employment income, like we talked about, even though the overall limit is 53, if you only make $20,000, you're not going to be able to put more than $20,000 into your 401k plan. Spouses, we talked about that. How So we talked about that a lot, you know, in terms of separate accounts, separate loan. So it's similarly, it's going to be separate contribution limits. So if it's that S corporation, right, it's going to be based off of that spouse's uh, W-2 income. You're not able to double dip off of one person's uh, W-2 income in determining the contribution limits. And finally, we, talked, we touched on uh, contributing to multiple 401k plans. That's, the, again, the concept with the individual that has the day job that they're contributing to, and then they're also contributing to the solo 401k. So um, that goes through uh, all the contribution uh, topics that we wanted to go over today. The, and that really brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I do appreciate everyone for joining. Uh, we'll go ahead and send around a recording of this uh, presentation. And uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. You can reach us at 1-800-489-7571. Uh, you can email us at uh, info at mysolo401k.net or you can email me directly at george at mysolo401k.net.